to prevent coking, this is actually talking about uh, superchargers and stuff, uh, engine repair test 1314 um, from chapters 13 and 14 of automotive engine repair. To prevent coking after hard operation, it is important to let the turbo bearings cool for 30 seconds to one minute. You need to do that. Uh, as a matter of fact, though, most people that drive an engine that's turbocharged, they just treat it like any other turbo engine. I mean, I mean, any other engine that's not turbo, they just shut it off. That, and they don't typically have all that much trouble with it, but it's just a good idea. You know, it's, it's a good practice. Know how hard you run it, too. Yeah, good practice to do that. What is it? Um, that's, uh, that oil turns into carbon, you know. Oil turns into carbon, you know, because of all that heat and everything. And, um, and a lot of times your seals in a turbocharger, like on some of these turbocharged diesels, the seals in the turbocharger will fail and it'll start pumping oil in there. Into the uh, over boosting can occur if the boost control solenoid or bypass valve sticks. That's a, that's true. Uh, if you've got a, a bypass valve, you know, basically opens up to let some of the gas bypass the turbocharger. Um, yeah, I told you about that uh, girl there. Hey, Donnie, I just started my lecture there, buddy. Let me call you back in about an hour. But, uh, anyway, uh, this, uh, that one little uh, 88 Saab, I was telling some of y'all about that the other day, um, had a uh, turbocharger on it. And this girl was saying sometimes it won't start. So she comes over here, and I looked it up. And basically on that one, to prevent it from over-boosting, they had a vacuum switch or a sort of pressure switch that was connected with a vacuum hose to the uh, engine. And if that pressure switch saw a pressure that was above a certain level, it would interrupt the current of the fuel injectors. I mean, the, it turned the fuel injectors off so that you couldn't overboost. If you overboosted, it was a sort of a safety thing. And that particular little switch uh, in the Saab shop manual, because they use different words than we do, uh, said it was behind the fascia. You know what the fascia is, right? Nope. You know, what I think about when I think of fascia, because of having been exposed to dealership terminology, is the uh, part below the bumper down there where the fog lights usually are. That's what I think about as a fascia, right? Okay, so the things, what happened was this girl, uh, I went over there and I, I was trying to, I saw the schematic that this thing, there was no power at the injectors, this thing right here is what interrupted that. And so I took, and I bypassed that little switch because I found it above the park brake pedal up here on the, in the, up under the dash or whatever in that area you know above your left foot and the way I found it was I found a vacuum line going inside that didn't go to the air conditioner stuff and I followed it in there when I followed it in there I saw this little white pressure switch with the two and when I crossed it off the injector got power and it fired up and I kind of tapped on that and it started working but it's obviously an oxidized contact in it or something and so I told her, I says, uh, I'm not going to be able to get, get one of these here. I wasn't about to disable that thing. I wasn't going to bypass it. You know, if she overboosted and blew the motor up, it'd be on me. You see what I'm saying? So I said, you just leave it. There's some things you don't modify, right? I mean, so uh, I always talk about this cruise control, airbag, you know, you don't fool with that. You just leave it like they've designed it. That's the best thing you can do. Don't tinker with that stuff. So I'm going to leave that safety thing alone, too. So she took it to Mama, and Mama says, we're not going to listen to nobody like that, we're going to take this thing to the Saab dealership in Montgomery, and they're going to fix it right because it was sometimes it was sometimes no start, basically. And so I saw that girl later, and she told me that three thousand dollars later, that oh, car still had. They put a fuel pump, they put an engine controller, uh, they put part of the wire harness on it, and she kept telling them all that. All you have to do is replace that little pressure switch down there. You know, she couldn't explain to him how she knew that, but they wouldn't listen to her because she was blonde. And they didn't think she had any sense. And they says, and she says, it's right here above your foot inside the car. And they, they said, no, it's not. It's down there behind the bumper somewhere because it says it's behind the fascia. You know, these guys. How much did they know? You see what I'm saying? But I mean, that was a ton of money. Well, I mean, she she spent, herself. I don't know if they ever got that car fixed, but all, that's all it needed. You know, and but they wouldn't listen to her. Her mama wouldn't listen to her, and the people at the dealership wouldn't listen to her. And they were just throwing parts of that sucker and raking money in with both ends. I don't know if, you know, and the car's still not starting. But anyway, that was whatever, you know. That you can only help some people so much. Weak valve springs can cause valve float, which may cause the engine to misfire. 
You know what valve float is, right? What's float? What's floating valves? Did it come off the come out of the daggone spring? Well, no, it's not that. The when they float, it's whenever the spring is not strong enough to close them as fast as it should. And you can float valves by over revving. See, if the spring is not fast enough, you see? See what I'm saying? If the, if the valve hasn't had time to close, that's a floating valve. And it can either be because you're spinning the engine too fast or because the valve spring is just not strong enough to close it. And what makes a valve spring weak? It either breaks or it gets too hot. If it gets too hot, take some temper out of it. So anyway, yeah, that causes that. And number four, if the vacuum is normal, the engine is developing adequate compression. <laughs> Think about our neon now. We've got 140, 550 pounds of compression, but no vacuum. It's just that's a mysterious thing. We'll figure that out. Uh, number five, uncooled intake air on a turbocharged engine can exceed 200 degrees Fahrenheit. This may result in all the following conditions except, what, A, less dense intake air. is going to do that, isn't it? Okay, B. Restriction of it. intake air. Yes, yeah, it's, it's going to be, uh, it's let's like see. We yeah, have reduction of power. You're going to have that less oxygen content in the intake air. See if you cool the engine. No, restriction of intake air is not something that that's going to cause. You're still going to get it. But you're, you're not going to get as much power because look at the other three answers. Uh, the intake air is actually um, not as... We want it to be dense because in a dense, cold, dense air has got more oxygen in it than hot, thin air. And have you ever noticed how whenever you're driving in the rain, your car seems like it's got more power? If it's cool or it's rainy, you got it, it runs stronger? I mean, if you're, if you're really in tune with that. I was riding this jet boat one time with these guys. And it was, this one of them 80-mile-an-hour boats that, you know, scoots across the water. And he was always lamenting the fact that he couldn't get over a certain amount of RPM when he had that thing pedal to metal. And it was funny because I, like when I got into that thing, you know, and I ain't never been much of a boat person, you know. When I was watching this tachometer, I was sitting up front. And one of the guys that was standing inside told me, they said, if you hadn't rode one of these, don't look over your shoulder whenever that thing is going or you'll lose your sunglasses, you know. And so we got to coming back, uh, and the uh, raining, it started raining. Well, he was trying to get back before the rain got any worse. Of course, you know, when you're going 80 miles an hour, that rain feels like machine gun bullets hitting you, you know. And he looked back and lost his glasses and him trying to drive that boat. <laughs> well, I had to give him my boat. But the point is, he was looking at the tachometer, and he said, um, I'm getting nearly 5,000 RPM, and I usually only get 4,000. But he was getting this cold, wet air, you see. He didn't understand that, but he was excited about it. But what he didn't realize was you have to drive it in a dead gum rain or in real cold conditions. or, or have, You know, you can have cold air intake, which is a lot of you guys have done that before. That's the same reason, see. Cold air intake does... What is that? Okay, number six. When producing maximum boost, turbochargers spin at what do they spin at? Huh? 100 to 150,000 RPM. That thing is really whirling. To control boost pressure, most modern supercharging systems to begin with, G Greasy, you guys, what's the difference between a supercharger and a turbocharger? Yeah, a supercharger basically is going to be spun by a belt. And a turbocharger is going to be spun by exhaust, and it feeds itself that way. To control boost pressure, in modern supercharging systems employ a vacuum-operated bypass valve and a PCM. Come on. If the bypass valve sticks open, boost pressure and power will do what? Increase the It'll reduce. It won't be as much there. Do what? It, it will. It will reduce on a. Now they're talking about a supercharger. Uh-huh. If the bypass valve is open, you know. Of course, even on a turbocharger, you know, if your if your uh, wastegate it stays open, you're not going to get any boost. You know. Yeah. All right. So, um, when operational, a supercharger may rob how much? When operational, it's going to borrow a little bit of power to spin itself. B is the answer to that one. Fifty horsepower. You're going to gain though, because you're going to get more than that back if you're going through an intercooler. A normal, huh? You're getting what about forty percent of your engine's power with a decent one. With what now? Supercharger. 
Yeah, the, it depends on the size of everything, and you got an intercooler that cools the air down after you squeeze it and all that. There's a lot of dynamics there. I mean, if you you could throw a foggy figure out there, but it's something like that. It increases volumetric efficiency by forcing the air instead of letting the engine suck it in. Yeah, you're going to do some good there. A normal cranking vacuum reading should be in between what? Cranking vacuum is when you're spinning the engine over, ignition system disabled, no fuel going in there. You're going to see how much you got when you're cranking it, right? That's going to be three to six. Three to six inches of mercury. A normal cranking vacuum. And technician, they says low cranking, engine cranking speed can cause low cranking vacuum. Well, he's right, I think, don't you think? Yep. Technician B says a performance camshaft can cause low cranking vacuum. Right. He's right, too. A performance camshaft is going to cause low vacuum at idle, too. And if you cam a car up that's running with a MAP sensor, like some of these Chryslers or some of the older Fords, you're going to have a rich running engine at idle, but it's going to run normal at road speed. I've been thrown out of a racetrack a lot of times for having custom cut cam. Yeah. So. I heard that you can uh, damage one or the other not having a uh, good uh, torque converter and cam and sink. Yeah. One that wouldn't correspond well. Yeah, people have gone that, people have already uh, blazed that trail and learned that stuff. And that, I'm glad they were the ones that were spending the money and not me. I never did. I mean, you know, some people do that racing stuff, and that's why you have to have sponsors if you're going to do it, or lots of money, because they'll blow, you know, five, six thousand dollar bill an engine. They blow it up after running it one time. Uh, it depends on what class you're running. That's street stuff. Yeah. You know the those those top fuel dragsters like they do. You know, that's got each cylinder on a top fuel dragster has got as much horsepower as an NASCAR engine. You know, you're running. 1500 horsepower on a NASCAR engine. Your spring on the NASCAR cost more than my whole car. Yeah, but eight to 10,000 horsepower is what you're running on one of them top fuel reactors. Mm -hmm. And it only turns 900 RPM from the time they jump off the starting line to the time they hit the thing. Sorry. And they rebuild it after every run. I know, it only turns 900 yeah. RPM. The only reason I knew that was I was up there. I had never been a racing buff or a high performance thing. My dad always shied away from that because he got involved with that some in his shop. People wanted to build him some hot rod engine. He built a hot rod engine. They go blow it up, and they try to blame him because they claim he didn't build it right or something. So he said, "I ain't fooling with me." So he just quit having anything to do with anything high performance because you know people were never satisfied. And it's, but anyway, uh, that uh, well, I went to Skills USA uh, national competition with one of my students that had won gold at state, and they the army had their uh, top fuel dragster there. And they were actually telling you all of these facts and figures and specs and all that. I said, pretty cool, you know. But it's just tremendously from powerful stuff there. Okay, number. Wait a minute here. Twelve. When testing for warm valve guide, worn valve guides using the vacuum gauge, the guides are considered worn if the vacuum gauge fluctuates between what? Three and seven inches of vacuum. Three and seven inches of vacuum. You need to remember this stuff. You got to write it down. Now, to test for restricted exhaust using a vacuum gauge, the technician will watch for a drop in vacuum when driving a vehicle or holding the engine RPM above. Yeah, that's a C, 2500. Um, I will tell you this, though. Some of the some of the GM cars, uh, they hit rev limiter at about 4K. You know, like some of your... 000102. Uh, we've seen that. You hit about 4,000 RPM, they start dropping injector. Mom, 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 mom. You hear them bumping the rev limiter? Uh, Ford hits that at 6,000, or that's where it used to be. Uh, GM? Uh, uh, yeah, so, but the one that we were actually fighting with, the one that had a had bad power, I mean, you know, because of a clogged exhaust, but we were having trouble doing some of the tests because it kept hitting rev limiter too early. And, uh, I worked on an Explorer one time. It had a V6 in it, and it was hitting something that felt like rev limiter about 4,000, even when you were really getting in it. And it was a doggone wire harness problem. You know, that I had to replace the wire harness on the engine, which was a big job because it ran up under everything and all that kind of stuff. Put a wire harness on it, all that went away. But, um, but I had already done a whole lot of diagnostics before I got to the point to where I decided the wire harness needed to be replaced. But um, anyway, let's look at uh, number 14 to cool the intake air and make a Denser and intercooler may be added, if you got that right. Now, 15, the time it takes for the turbo to spool up is called turbo what? Lag. Lag. Uh, you do away with that when you got a variable geometry turbocharger because 
Uh, it acts like a small turbocharger whenever it needs a small turbocharger, and it acts like a big one when it needs a big one by changing the angle of those vanes. When you bend those vanes down, it shoots that exhaust out and hits that little uh, impeller and makes it go faster. It spools it up quicker, see? So then when it opens them up, you got more exhaust flow. Uh, but anyway, that's pretty cool how that kind of thing works. Duramax uses that, and the power stroke uh, engines use it, you know, on that. Uh, let me see, number 16. The turbo adds pressure in what? Air. Heat. It's going to heat it up. The technician should always replace valve blink when replacing valve guides. The seals, always put the seals on there. And listen to this, guys. If you don't put good quality valve stem seals on there, you may as well not be putting any on there at all. Years ago, whenever uh, Lamont, whenever he was here, he put valve stem seals on this 91 Dodge pickup that belonged to the president of the college. And you air up each cylinder, you take your rocker arms off, and you take the springs off, and you put valve stem seals on there, and you put it all back together. And, you know, you replace valve stem seal with a car, engine in a car, it's just fairly standard. And we've done it on Toyotas. You know, the Toyota place pulls the head off and sends it to the machine shop to have the valve stem seals replaced because they go, you know, they'll, when you crank it up and it smokes up the parking lot first thing in the morning, but it don't smoke much the rest of the day, valve stem seals are what's wrong with it. And, uh, but those, those valve uh, springs are down in the little wells where that cam follower runs. And it's uh, Booger Bear, if you ain't got, some way of setting up to get those things out of there and back in, you ain't going to do it. And so I think the labor to pull a head off and put it back on and get that done at the Toyota place, labor and parts, now like $2,000. As high as I'll get out on a four-cylinder Camry. Right? Well, we actually took the camshafts out of the way. And uh, as a matter of fact, David Buck did one. And I uh, pulled them out of the way, and I got a special tool that I made that you – I used an old seat clamp and a plate and, you know, a little special tool to squeeze them springs. And you can get them valve stem seals replaced fairly easily. And then the car is fixed and gone within half a day if you're a quick operator. And the smoke problem's gone, and you haven't had to do all this intrusive head gasket stuff and everything like that, you know. That's just a smart way to do that. And I, like I say, I, I had written an article about it. It can be done. And we've done it on more than, we've done it on several Toyotas here that were, because of the fact they were smoking like they were. Okay, now number 18. An incorrect or defective blank valve could possibly cause low but steady vacuum reading. PCV valve. Do you think that you have a PCV valve that's bad on your neon out here, you think? No. <laughs> we'll see. 19. An adequate but steady vacuum reading could be caused by faulty blank components. Adequate but unsteady, excuse me, adequate but unsteady, that's 19. Ignition components. Weak valve blank would be indicated by normal steady vacuum reading through the lower RPM range, but fluctuates as engine speeds increase. Weak valve springs. And once again, how do valve springs get weak, particularly all of them? If for some reason they get too hot. If for some reason they get too hot. All right. Sir? Can it be what? An injector? Uh, it can be weak because it's, you mean not putting as much fuel in there because it's dirty or? Uh, for, if you don't, if it doesn't sound like the rest of them, yeah, you're probably going to need to. I mean, I'd be listening to it with a stethoscope. Be sure. Huh? What he's talking about is moving them from one cylinder to the other. Yeah, just swap them. Move the one that's skipping to this cylinder and see if the cylinder moves with it and the skip moves with it. All right, let's go to our next test now.